somebody's picking this up. Hold on the mic. It should not be down here. It should be like right here. And I've got mine. We, we're, we're all we're very concerned about um, popping your peas. So like when I bring in people to, to the studio, it depends on where the mic is positioned. And if it's in the wrong place, you'll hear it when a, and you won't notice it until you hear the tape back. There'll be a lot of peas, pea sounds. Uh, and so sometimes we have them say Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. And so I'll watch the audio file, the wave file. Oh, okay, now we'll move your mic, mouth a little bit. Um, and S's is another sound that I'm having trouble with when I hear my reporters produce copy and there'll be a lot of sss. I'm like, wow, what's, but they have programs you can run the audio through to fix it. Uh, but you don't want to do that. You want to get the, the mic position right first so that it's not you know, things we worry about. <laughs> I've already learned so much. <laughs> Well, uh, welcome. Um, I'm Christy Smith. I'm the assistant dean at the Center for Diversity Center, ah, the Center for Diversity and Inclusion here at WashU, um, and and the senior scholar there. And I'm, I'm thoroughly delighted to welcome David Casares, who is an editor with St. Louis Public Radio, um, and then Stephen Harowitz, of course, here is the associate director of the Harvey Media Center, um, to co-produce this this um, event. I learned about David Casares being new myself to St. Louis. Um, driving around and listening to the uh, fundraising campaign um, and heard him speaking about his experience, his identities, being multicultural, and then working within journalism. And I was very intrigued hearing you talk about, about that, those experiences and your desire to sort of broaden the reach of journalism, um, and thinking of whose stories to tell and such. Um, and then I sent him an email saying, I'd love to have you come and talk with us about social justice and journalism and amusingly you wrote back and said well those aren't things that we really talk about yeah. we do the news Who um, is this person <laughs> <laughs> but you graciously met with me and and now we're so happy that you're on campus with us um, so his special areas of expertise include uh, supervising coverage of immigration race and ethnicity ethnic and immigrant communities and of course music um, i'll let Steve, or Stephen, open us up with a few questions. Um, then I'll have some others for you, and then we'll we'll close with some some open Q and A for everyone here. Thank you so much I for being with us. I should say that um, some of, much of my family says Casares. I Cazares, say sorry. Casares, uh, which is a more authentic pronunciation. Because personally, I I wanted to get rid of an anglicized pronunciation in my family. It has a lot to do with uh, coping skills that Mexicans have done in this country. I'm of Mexican and black American heritage, if anybody wondered, um, for a long time. And I don't need to cope. I'm very happy with who I am and uh, who I want to be. <laughs> we can get into that later. Thank but you. Go ahead. <laughs> you actually gave me a really nice transition into my question, which was, tell me how you got into this work and how you got to St. Louis. OK, so well, I'll give you a brief bio. I'm from Indianapolis. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm one of 15. I'm like the fifth child of 15. My parents, um, my dad's Mexican-American from Texas, my late father. My mom's a black woman from Indiana. They met in a Pentecostal church in 1952. At the time, uh, Mexicans were considered Spanish on the census, and Indiana had a, a miscegenation law. So they went to Chicago to get married to make sure they weren't breaking any laws. Oh. And then they came back, and they had 15 kids, and you know, and, uh, you know forget your law. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, so I grew up in this large family in Indiana, which is not a perfect state. Uh, it has a black community, and I was raised in the black community in the, the black church. And my dad was, um, it was very Mexican American, although we didn't think of him in those terms because we never talked a lot about race and culture and identity because we just who were who we were. Uh, and I'm a lot like my father, um, uh, uh, for better and for worse, probably. Uh, so, but we grew up uh, struggling because he had a third grade education, and my, par and my mom uh, never went to college. Uh, and it was kind of tough, and I delivered like newspapers as a kid to help the family, uh, and I never saw people like me in those pages or my parents. You know, it was uh, uh, a family, uh, uh, you know, a conservative paper owned by um, Dan Quayle's family. To be to make mm -hmm. a long story short, if, if you don't know who Dan Quayle is, um, uh, you should. <laughs> Former Vice President <laughs> of the United States, uh, and um, it. it but I was studying like uh, how to run printing presses because I was, you know, yeah. we came from a working class family. That's what you did. You learned how to do stuff. And I had brothers in the military. 
Uh, but I, I knew I wanted to write. So after um, I went to junior college and got out, was running printing presses in a, in a horrible um, sweatshop. Uh, uh, I went back to school, got a journalism and Spanish degree. Uh, went to grad school for a while to study Spanish literature, figured out I did not want to teach. But I knew I wanted to be in uh, communications or journalism. So I went to work for a small paper in Indiana, got a break about a year and a half later, and went to work for the Courier Journal in Louisville, which mm -hmm. at that time was a great newspaper um, and uh, with a story history uh, and a history of, of advocating for civil rights. Um, and uh, after six years there, went to uh, the Sun Sentinel, which is a Fort Lauderdale-based newspaper in South Florida, which is a community of um, six million people with a lot of immigrants. Um, uh, and um, there's a history of racial and ethnic politics, which is all about survival in that region. Uh, and I ran their Miami Bureau, uh, was a um, Havana correspondent briefly as I filled in for somebody, was a race and demographics editor, uh, all kind of stuff, um, had led, led immigration coverage. Uh, then I got laid off uh, from the newspaper industry after a career of about 20 years and headed to Minnesota Public Radio to enter the nonprofit world where I learned how to do some radio stuff but was still editing for the web and other things that were related to newspapers. I was laid off after six years from that place, which brought me to St. Louis to put my career back on track and we'll see where it leads me. But here, I lead um, a team that covers arts and culture, health and science, so my brain is going back and forth. I was working with the diversity fellow and I soon will be um, editing the a digital reporter whose work is for the web first, even though we're a radio station, we try to do um, both. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have a lot uh, of interest in culture and race and ethnicity because of my background, because of my interests, but I'm also sort of an old school journalist that was taught by uh, old school editors who said, you know, this is the way we do things and it's about objectivity. Uh, I'm, I'm a person who believes in writing from the point of view of the communities we cover. I want, you know, cause I want, I don't think those voices have often enough been included, especially of, of uh, disadvantaged, uh, marginalized communities, and we need to. Uh, but as a journalist, I've had to take off my person's hat and be a, a bit dispassionate, even when it goes against every instinct of mine. Uh, and sometimes when I'm working with young people who are coming up in a different time, well, they didn't want to have to put up with the nonsense that I had to put up with uh, from, um, it, editors in the majority community, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, and I find myself enforcing rules that I never really agreed with, but I know are good for our business because we have a different audiences that we serve. And sometimes people come in and they wanna like, I wanna fight the power, well, okay. Uh, or uh, fight the patriarchy, yeah, okay. Uh, but you're not, you're cut, uh, there's a scene in this movie, The Paper, I don't know if you've seen that movie, where the managing editor played by Glenn Close is uh, uh, she's, she's associating with all these really rich people and she's asking her boss for a raise and he takes her, you know, she goes into the men's bathroom, I think, with him and he looks at her and says, <laughs> you know, you hang out with all these people with a lot of money. We're not them, you know. <laughs> We're journalists and you can, you, this is our business and you, you can't be those people. Uh, now we want to tell the stories of our communities and as a person of color who mentors other people of color, I'm really big on that, but there is a line a movable line sometimes that you can't cross. And um, so, for example, when people come to me and they say, oh, I wanna cover the protests. Well, okay, uh, so do I, but that's just one, one, you're not a protester, so you have to be very careful about that and sort of make sure you're telling the story of what they're doing and not what you're doing. And, and you don't wanna get arrested also, that's, an, that's another story. And two, that's just one piece. Like if you were covering black people in St. Louis, and you're only covering protesters out in the streets, you're missing a whole hell of a lot. Of like the black church, people who are civil rights lawyers, uh, uh, people who are fighting for change within their institutions, be they institutions like this, or medicine, or, you know, or um, uh, any other kind of place that they work in science. Uh, and you need to tell all of those things. And sometimes I have trouble, uh, and, and maybe, I'm, maybe I'm an anachronism, but I, uh, I wanna make sure that we do those things in a way that's faithful to our business and, and our philosophy as journalists. Uh, so it's tricky. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about the influences that you've had in your career that formed that view of your work. 
Well, um, well, I worked. Uh, for, well, I started out working for like uh, an editor who uh, taught me about the economy of writing. So I'm very, and I'm very big on this. You know, mm -hmm. you got to get the facts, and you have to write in a clear, uh, understandable way that does not have a lot of jargon. Whether you're writing for the listeners or for uh, readers or for people who watch TV, for that matter, uh, does not have a lot of jargon that is uh, active voice. Uh, if anybody says, "Oh, he was arrested," and and people were were tear gassed, or and like a who did what mm -hmm. to whom, uh, and this is a very fundamental lesson in uh, writing, and uh, and it forces you to get the facts. It compels you to, okay, who is responsible for what action, and often people in authority they don't want to tell you. They, uh, the police, if they write a press release, will say, "Oh, uh, 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 this man was arrested," and and uh, such and such happened, and I like, hey, or, or he was shot uh, after officers responded to the scene. I want to say, well, you mean the officer shot him, right? Okay, which officer shot him, and what was his name, and uh, how long has he been with the department? All those things mm -hmm. I start like, thinking about, okay? Because that's, that's when you get to real truth telling, and, and so focusing on writing, uh, like this editor had me do a long time ago, his name was John Harmon um, in Indiana, uh, it was real important. Now, I knew that I was working for uh, what I would candidly say is the white establishment media. And as a person who had other interests and who is concerned about social justice, I knew I had to balance my interest in telling the stories of communities that are important to me and their concerns that never seem to make it into those spaces, but do it within a framework of doing my job well. Um, subsequently, I got to work with editors who were like me, but who had, were more experienced, uh, who taught me how to navigate uh, the, the serious concerns that we had uh, uh, while trying to have a successful career. Uh, and it's, it, part of it's like not fighting, not, not, not fighting a battle over everything, you know? Like sometimes, uh, you know, I would write stuff and it, people, would, editors would change it and I, I, I meant to say it this way and now as an editor I, who changes stuff, I want to say, well, you know, if it's really a big thing that's really important, we can have a, because uh, I believe writing often is, a, is about fighting about words, but if you're arguing with me over every little thing because it's, it's about your vision, uh, you're not learning anything. Um, you have to learn how to, uh, you know, figure out what's important and, what, and that it's a long struggle. Like I tell people the reason, my daughters, when I tell them the reason I vote every time, midterm election, local election, state elections, is because I know that this battle for justice and democracy in our country is, 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 a, is a long one and it has many chapters and um, if you skip some, uh, you're going to miss a, miss a chance to participate and, and, and so that same thing applies to me and what I do. I want to make sure that I'm there all the time, that I'm not killing myself over any particular thing but thinking about the long goal, the long arc of history in our short lives um, and how we figure into it. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to work in some places where with large minority communities where those things were more important than others. Uh, and even in places like this where we still seem, see things through the typical uh, American prism of black and white society and forget that there's a lot of other people. Um, uh, I think I can help change things, but it may not be as fast as other people want it to be, um, or even that I, as I want it to be. But um, uh, I, I've learned that I have to um, to think about the different audiences, and sometimes when you're passionate about one thing, I'm thinking about m the audience that's in my head and the audience of people I know immediately. I'm forgetting about hey, there's a bunch of other people. I got to weigh all those things. I don't know if this makes any sense, but um, it's things I think about. Uh, you know, you've given us a lot uh, to think about in terms of the, the example of when close in the paper, and you're not them. Right. Right, of what the role of journalists is. And it, it, it has sort of been thought of as journalists are in some ways a safeguard to democracy. You're supposed to have a way to contribute or to, to speak back and let people know what's going on, to give the right information so that then you can get this feedback loop back to people who are in elected politicians. Um, and yet, you know, right now, much like other points in U.S. history, we have an ever-expanding array of news options. And so people can get their, their news from lots of different sources, Twitter, Facebook, newspapers, 
Vine, I guess, is no longer with us. But you know, there's all these various ways that you could yeah. get news, right? And so there's not some sort of cohesive um, understanding of what constitutes a fact. Um, and I, I, I sort of would want to push back on the idea that there's ever been a moment when it's easy to figure out what's fact versus how things are being framed. Um, but what do you see as the role for NPR, for instance, in helping to, to create an educated populace? Well, a couple of things. One, we used to have this, um, uh, we had limited options, and we were all tuning into the same few sources, for better and mm -hmm. or for worse. Uh, like we all watched, my, in my dad's generation, they all watched Walter Cron Cronkite, and they all read the morning newspaper. Uh, so th uh, th it, there was an advantage to that, and everybody was operating from the same accepted framework of what is news based on what the gatekeeper said it was. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage is there were a lot of left out voices, which is what compelled me and a lot of other people right. to get into the business. And we've been fighting for 40 some years to uh, bring more people like ourselves in. And we've been, it's one step forward and one step back a lot of times, because a lot of people of my generation have left. And so we never make progress. Uh, I think it's great that people get their news from a lot of different sources. And I certainly advocate and advise that you should be reading, you know, all kinds of different things, you know, the best, you know, the Times and the Post and, and the New Yorker and, and uh, the alternative magazines and uh, the, the Nation. Uh, you should be listening to NPR and your local affiliate. You should be watching local TV. Maybe avoid cable news, <laughs> uh, except sometimes. They're a benefit sometimes. Like if something big happens, like the shooting in Texas, you know where I went? I went to the local paper in Texas because they knew they were the closest to it. And all that's important. What I worry about is that we're only going to those sources that validate our worldview uh, and Facebook has screwed up a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm going to skip around a lot of it because of their algorithm that gives you yeah. what they think you want to, uh, uh, to, to, to see and hear and read. And they also, you, there's a way you can go click on your Facebook profile and it can determine how it cla classifies me as, as, as somebody who's fairly liberal and progressive and it classifies somebody else uh, as, um, as conservative. And then sometimes it's confusing because I have a, my brother is very conservative and reads and disseminates things that I don't even want to see. And so I, I'm constantly trying to block those sites. And, and I don't watch Fox News except on occasion. Uh, I think their news people are pretty good. I think their uh, opinion people stink. Uh, but um, uh, uh, so there's that's that problem. Uh, uh, I was thinking about this a lot when we had the live streaming of the protests in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there are people in society who think, well, the news media is all corrupt, and uh, and I understand that view. I think it's wrong. Uh, I think um, there are media organizations that do the wrong thing, but I, I wouldn't make a blanket accusation against anybody. And you never know all the things that a person is doing. I think we make our mistakes. Like here, we don't. We haven't always um, uh, had the right amount of people on our staff from various communities, and we haven't always uh, made sure to include the voices of enough people in this region. And this happens everywhere, all across the country. Um, it, so it, it is important uh, to seek different voices, and it's important for local people to try to use the technology that's allowing them to live stream. And sometimes, though, when I'm looking at some of those efforts, I'm thinking, uh, well, well, this is great. But to a person who doesn't understand what journalism is, and I guess anybody can be a journalist since we're not regulated, uh, but as I was telling you, you know, I know what journalism is when I see it and when I know it's, what it's not. And sometimes uh, people who are doing those things uh, are really good. Uh, and sometimes even the ones that I disagree with serve a very vital function because I, I, I watched all that stuff during the pro and it was very helpful to me. But I watched uh, the fact that th some of these folks were not able to have to know when to take off the activist hat that's their personal life. And, and to act like a journalist, you know, they, and they were uh, being very provocative and, and maybe that's the way they think journalism ought to be, you know. Uh, now, and that's okay, uh, but if somebody comes into my newsroom and says, I'm gonna be like that live streamer, that's what I want your newsroom to be, and I'm, that's the spirit that I'm gonna come bring with me, I'm gonna say, you know, I'm with you on a lot of stuff, but that's not the way we do things here because, uh, within, we, because we want the, the, the vast audience to trust us. Uh, to know that we're not really on anybody's side, uh, we're on the side of truth uh, um, and, and, and uh, paying fairness to evidence. Uh, I don't believe anymore in a 50-50, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. journalism where it's like, you know, oh, the cops say this, and on the other hand, somebody says this. Well, no, sometimes truth is truth. And sometimes leaving out a voice is good if, it, if what they're saying isn't true, you know. Uh, however, I, I do think um, we don't want to be viewed as partisan. Although I have written and edited some things that some people didn't like and says, aha, that's proof that this guy, because they have a worldview that says that, um, uh, there is a worldview that says that uh, the opposite of objectivity is partisanship. Like I have a friend who I uh, went to college with in journalism who says, uh, he's now very right wing, and he says, the reason I watch those websites, even though I know it's false uh, and, and not true and misleading, is because it counters uh, what people like you are doing, and it's the other side. I said, what if people like me are doing journalism that really is trying to hold people account accountable and gets to the truth and is it based as accurate as possible and, and pl plays fairness to sources? You know, what's wrong with that? Because he is so for his particular po political point of view that he thinks that paying attention to those sites that go crazy, uh, in my opinion, uh, are a counter to uh, but that's not the way journalism is. It's not supposed to be like we're in one camp and you're in the other. I mean, with some exceptions. I mean, I, you know, there's some like opinion journalism that is definitely, mm -hmm. but that's opinion journalism. Yeah, and there's a place for that. But what I'm talking about is journalism that seeks to serve society and inform people uh, and give them information and, and knowledge. Uh, it, now, there are people who don't understand that the editorial page exists within a newspaper and it's separate from what the reporters do or they don't want to acknowledge it. Uh, I do and I know that. And I, I think most of the public should be able to know the difference. So when, you know, as, as, as we're sort of moving away from the old 50-50 model, what advice do you have as you're, as you're talking with young journalists about how to figure out what the facts are um, in a time when objectivity is rather disputed and truthiness and um, fake news or terms that get bandied about. Yeah, well, some of that, though, is um, uh, the people who are throwing out terms like fake news, they know what they're doing, you know. And the problem is that a lot of people are buying that as if it were true, right? you know. Uh, but it, you know, people who are using propaganda techniques, they know they're doing that. Now, as you're a young journalist, um, well, one, what you want to do is learn the craft. And when I say learn the craft, I don't just mean the new technology. It's one thing to know how to use a, an audio recorder and shoot video and take good photos and, 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 and build really cool um, things for the web. Uh, and all those are very needed skills. But this, those skills and techniques are just part, are just, are just tools that we use. They're, they're, they're not necessarily journalism unless you put them to the service of journalism. And the service of journalism is about asking good questions, uh, doing your homework, uh, finding out the context of something, making sure you don't leave out anything. Uh, like when I see a story come across my desk and I, or I listen to it, uh, I'm listening for a couple of things. Um, uh, does the, are the facts there? And for, first thing I listen to is like, tell me what the story is and what you think it's gonna be before you do it. And before you even start reporting or after you just, and so the reporter comes to me and he gives me a pitch or she gives me a pitch. And I said, this is the story that I wanna tell and these are the sources that I'm going to call and contact mm -hmm. and the information I'm going to look up or the documents that I'm going to rely on um, for evidence. Uh, and then I'll say, okay, good. Put it in writing for me. Because I believe that if you can write, if you, if you can think it, you can write it, it's, it's proof that you, you know where you're going with it. And if you can't write it, uh, I'm worried that when you actually start to write the actual piece of journalism, you're going to be lost with no roadmap. Or when you start to write the script, you're going to be lost, and, and, and then I'm going to have to fix things or help you try to fix things down the road, which is way after the fact, just like uh, uh, turning in a term paper based on, on your notes without, like, uh, you know, doing the required evidence and, and, and putting your footnotes in and everything and saying, okay, and writing a thesis statement. So I, I require these sort of, like, thesis statements. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and then during that process, you should be following guidance. You should be reading what other people do. Um, you should be, um, because we have people who are there to help you make sure you do the right thing. It's not, no journalist <coughs> operates on his own or her own. Um, you gotta follow the roadmap and make sure you're, you're um, seeking the right sources, 
talking to a variety of sources, getting a variety of different voices. It used to be we would rely on the first draft, whatever the police said, mm. like if it was a shooting or something. And, and the next day, we would go out and maybe talk to people who knew the person who the police shot or something. Well, now we have to do all that faster, because in part because our audience is smarter uh, and, uh, and, and everybody's carrying a cell phone, and sometimes people have stuff before we have it. Uh, now, we want to verify things before we publish. We want to make sure we got names written down. If we talk to somebody, we find out who they are, where they're from, how, uh, you know, basic stuff like how old you are, what do you do. Uh, if it's a, char uh, like a, a charge story, like, a, like what, do you have an ax to grind? You know, all, uh, all these things are in the back of my head. And sometimes a person who's not thinking about all that stuff, this is why we have editorial mm -hmm. review, because you're like, okay, well, who is this person? Like I had, uh, and sometimes professional journalists take shortcuts. I, I've t I, I know because I've done it. Like I'll interview the friend of a friend. <laughs> Instead of really going and searching for the, uh, the best source possible, I'll, I'll use the convenient one because I'm under a deadline pressure and I'm trying to get something done fast. And, and uh, also, it's also necessary that we critique our work. So we find out, I'm always trying to figure out what I did wrong how I could do it better, mm -hmm. how I could have helped the person I'm working with do it better. Um, uh, but sometimes the pressure of having to produce is so much that we don't do that enough. But um, So basically, doing your homework, seeking advice, um, uh, making sure you don't have it wrong, double checking things. Not everybody has a fact checker these days, um, mm -hmm. but your editors are there to check things. Sometimes running ideas by co your colleagues, uh, people who have more experience, um, making sure you have a wide, that you're not so narrowly focused on one point of view that you miss the obvious, you know. And checking your own biases, because we all have them, and I have them. Yeah, I guess one of the questions that I was curious to understand is, we, we've seen police involved violence, shootings, brutality for a very long time, centuries at this point. Um, and, and so there's some points where it, it starts to hit a threshold, and now we, we talk about it, we have research here um, we have Otis Johnson in sociology that's doing major research on this area. People pay attention to it in a different way. And, and the, the way that you were just relaying um, sort of how you go about the process of doing this work sounds a lot like it depends on who's actually in the newsroom as to which stories rise, which, which events rise to the level of becoming a story. Is that uh, after? Well, it, it, this is not a perfect business and, and, uh, and newsrooms can be messy places and, uh, and sometimes it, it does depend on who's in there. Um, but uh, you hope that everybody is smart enough to follow the same s sort of standard. Um, uh, although sometimes people like me who are hiring and we think about, okay, how can we improve the work that we do? We gotta make sure we hire. For example, I've been in communities where the immigration reporter, reporter in a large community of Spanish-speaking immigrants doesn't speak Spanish. And we think, uh, you know, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. We gotta make sure the next person we hire is bilingual, you know? Uh, that's pretty basic, uh, uh, but people can, even if you're not from, of a community, you can learn. One of the best uh, reporters I know who has covered Latin America is from Britain. She used to work for me. She was my immigration reporter in uh, Miami, a and she was uh, a Brit who learned how to speak Spanish as well or better, and I, I'm, Spanish is my second language. And she was in Colombia before she came to work for us in Florida, and she had been kidnapped by the FARC guerrillas. So, she was legit, you know, <laughs> and and uh, uh, and, um, and and she had immersed herself in the culture mm -hmm. and knew it. So we, it, yes, it does depend on who's in your newsroom, but you have to immerse yourself in the culture. You have to to learn how to be a better uh, journalist. You know, nobody comes into the business fully formed, uh, and if they think they are, they're wrong. You know, uh, and then um, sometimes you, sometimes you have to listen to who's talking around you. As an editor, I sometimes learn uh, all of the people who used to work for me in my early years are now my mentors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I call them my reverse mentors because they're much younger. Uh, but some of them, you know, I, when I need advice, uh, I, I go to them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and part of that is because they have, you have to keep educating yourself. We never stop learning. And you have to, to keep thinking, am I doing the right thing? Because you think you're doing the right thing, and, uh, you know and you're not necessarily. Yeah. So I have a question for you as far as where you feel the industry is moving. I think you hinted at a couple of those pieces as far as Facebook, but I'd be interested to know in 10, 20 years, where do you think the work of NPR is going? Oh, uh, see, I'm not a radio journalist. I should hasten, you've been asking me about NPR. 
I'm a newspaper guy who has made, made the trans and still making the transition to public media. And I believe in audio, I love it. And I love, like I'm gonna produce this piece on a Haitian American singer who sings mm -hmm. jazz, um, and, which isn't just about music, it's about culture. And I love doing that. Uh, but I am a student of media also, and I will tell you one thing that has been happening a lot in the last decade is our reliance on analytics. So we can tell by who, we can tell when you put a story on the internet, we can basically say, you know, this is being read by so many people and we're starting to look at what techniques work. This is a very controversial mm -hmm. subject in newsrooms. What techniques are grabbing the most eyeballs? And, um, and what kinds of headlines work the best, you know? Uh, there was the whole BuzzFeed approach where like, it was like they were doing lists, 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 mm -hmm. five things that will make you mad about your spouse, you know? And people click on that stuff, you know, like, <laughs> and unfortunately some of that, uh, uh, because it drives web traffic and the web traffic is a, attracts dollars from advertisers or underwriters, some of it's continuing to go in that direction, but it's always been with us, you know? Um, it, but the, the increased use of technology, the uh, doing everything faster, the, what, what I really worry about, uh, and I don't know how we're gonna deal with this, is we're doing things, one person's doing the things that five or six people did. It used to be we had multi-layered editing, where, and it was a one-stop thing where, you know, a reporter turned in his, uh, had worked with an editor and turned in a draft, the editor read it, the editor's colleague read it, their boss read it, then a copy editor read it, then um, another layer of the copying desk read it, uh, then the designer looked at it, and, and, and so people, when they talk about, you know, there's all these mistakes, this mistakes never used to happen as if we're like, you know, journalists are slobs now, the new generation doesn't know how to, no, it's just that it used to be all these people reading behind us. And even people like me who were in charge of making sure things are right, I used to have people behind me and now there's one person behind me where there would have been five behind me. Uh, and uh, so I worry about that. But we're going to get um, faster and better and uh, have to deal with changes like the, the disappearance of radio and cars. How do you deal with that? Uh, um, uh, the increasing uh, uh, use of podcasts to tell long stories that, that some people like, really like, and other people like the traditional model of shorter things where, where we are the gatekeeper and saying this is why it's important. Uh, 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 so all these rolling changes, I, th I think the increased use of technology, the, the um, you're gonna see more channels and different voices. I am worried about concentration of media ownership, you know, mm -hmm. Sinclair or whoever it is buying up all the TV stations, like as uh, Gannett, the newspaper chain, did with newspapers uh, years ago. Um, and it's, it's a struggle. I, I think in some places you're gonna see just big players emerge. Um, and um, the big worry is that the local and regional journalism sites are disappearing and that all of our journalists are concentrated on the coast and places like this, you know, if you're lucky, you have a good one or two outlets that are trying to still make it and serve the audience. And then uh, uh, the increased reliance on citizens seeking news delivered by people like them, which is good in a sense, but also if a lot of this information is not coming from people who are professionally trained, it's more entertainment than real um, accurate and um, quote unquote objective. And, uh, we can argue about ob objectivity because whether it's even a thing anymore, I think it is a thing, but is it a thing that people value <laughs> as much um, uh, throughout society? because we're in very different camps and you will continue to see media appealing to those different camps, um, which I think is not necessarily a good thing. So with that context in mind, what advice would you give to young journalists? Uh, well, my, my advice is, is to, if you wanna do something, to start doing it, to seek guidance and training in it as soon as possible. Uh, I, as I was mentioning earlier, if you want to, if you think you're in college and you want to become a journalist, you start you start doing journalism in college for your college um, in, institutions, uh, newspapers and and uh, and uh, video and radio operations if they, if they exist. You should and you should try to get professional experience while you're in college, because there are other students like you who are doing this. At Columbia University has a great journalism program. Um, Zoo has a good one. Uh, there are good ones in, say, Miami and Southern California and, and uh, in Minnesota where I lived. And there are students there getting practical experience working 
working in local newsrooms already. So you will find yourself, if you want to wait till you're after college to get started, and that can happen too, but, can, but you'll be competing with people who emerge. Sometimes they've already worked in five professional newsrooms and they're graduating from some colleges, from elite ones, and from even, uh, I've been, I'm happy to say, uh, I worked in Miami where I recruit students, and I, I, I always like to see the ones who were at the at Miami-Dade Community College because they were often immigrants, um, but they, they but they were like they had a hard work ethic because in part because they had to support their families, so they were working in professional jobs as students. Um, Florida International University has a great program uh, where you have a lot of bilingual students who speak uh, Spanish or Creole. So we try to get different skills as you get professional experience. If if you think you want to do something that has to do with diversity and, and um, different communities, it's important to know how to communicate with those folks. And uh, I know people, professional journalists who learned how to speak Spanish when they were 30, and by the time they were 40 and their careers were still going strong, they, they had a whole lot of different opportunities to pursue. Um, so don't wait. Yeah. I, I waited to do stuff that I wish I hadn't waited to do, because I was concerned about security and my family. and Those are very important things. but. Should we open it to questions? Oh, you can ask me anything. Yeah. yeah, if anybody has any questions for David, this would be a good time to ask him. I could keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but what are some differences and similarities between print journalism and radio journalism that you've noticed? Or just like, I don't know, what's unique about the radio community? Okay, well, I spent several years uh, taking news radio scripts and translating them and making them into newspaper stories because I used to distribute uh, Minnesota Public Radio content to a, a network of uh, newspapers. Uh, and uh, radio reporters uh, are in different camps. There are people who came from print who were good print reporters who learned how to become radio reporters. There are people who started in radio and are like diehard radio people and think that's what we ought to be doing and this print influence that's it's creeping into our business is, is this poisoning the well. Uh, and there are people who started in radio who, who saw the value of it. I, I once heard a LA Times editor say, I want to go back and forth between re uh, writing and editing so that I never lose touch with either. Uh, and the same thing is, and I enjoy producing audio because I, I want to make sure that I keep my hands on that, even though I'm editing radio reporters, and still write, you know, for the readers too. Uh, the similarities are, they both de depend on good reporting, uh, and and writing. Um, uh, what I would say is, radio is often about how well you can say it. Uh, I think active voice is very important, but if I'm writing something, I, as a, as a print, long time print writer, I will, I will write a radio script and I think, oh, I got it down, and then I'll get before the mic, and I'll find that my voice dies, or uh, I have trouble saying words, and it's often, I've got like a, it's because I have a 25 word sentence, and I just need to put, <laughs> I just break those, that, that 25 word sentence up into, in, in, into different pieces, so that my, my voice has a chance to recover, and people who have struggled with vocal fry, which is a very, it's a thing that young women in our business are criticized about, and some young men too. Uh, and something that often that can be solved um, by just s saying shorter sentences so your voice is fresh all the way through. Uh, but there are good uh, radio reporting as it's done in the NPR way often depends on the anecdotal lead where you hear a story about someone, you know, so, you know it's a, the, the, we call it it's a host lead where it's like uh, the facts. And so and so is going to talk to us about that. But then you, you're taken to this person's environment, whether it's a, a research lab or whether it's out on the street, and, and you're hearing a little bit about what's going on in their life. Uh, uh, and it, it's just in different places. Like if I were writing the print story, uh, I might start out with what's going on in that person's life. And then I would take that, that you know, here's what the story's all about thing uh, that the radio announcer says before introducing the piece by the, by the reporter, and I would stick that thing two or three paragraphs underneath, here's what's going on in that life, and here's why it's important to you, and then go back to that person's life. It's, it's very simple tricks. It's much much the same, actually. It's just in a different order. It's uh, uh, sometimes using uh, different uh, kinds of voicing. Uh, and uh, and if you think about it, uh, a good thing, a good trick to do would be to go and, and uh, listen to a radio story and then go to that website. And if it's done well, it won't look the same. Uh, it, and you'll, so you'll be reading the web version and hearing it like, hey, they did something with this, they changed it. 
Uh, um, and the best ones, uh, there are two different versions written, and they don't try to convert the script. They actually like mm -hmm. write for readers the first time, and they write for listeners the other time. Um, but the, but they, they, get the, they will both have facts. They will both have characters. Um, they will both have good transitions. The endings are always different, um, and they will. Um, so it's important to know those things. But it's, it's not overwhelming. People can bounce back and forth easy. I was wondering about any differences you noticed between working in newsrooms like on the coast, like in Fort Lauderdale or back in Minnesota in, in the Midwest. Uh, well, I, 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 there's a cultural change, for one. Uh, in, uh, well, South Florida has a lot of people from New York who are like really pushy, you know? And then it has a lot of immigrants uh, who have uh, their own, uh, with a different sense of time, and everybody is sort of like, says what's on their mind. Uh, and in the Midwest, I'm from Indiana, so this is true there too, but especially in Minnesota, and to a certain degree here, people say one thing, but they mean <laughs> something else. Like in Minnesota, the joke is um, uh, uh, people will invite you over to their house, but they don't really mean it until you, they say it three times. Oh, you should come over. That isn't, they're not serious. The, the third time they invite you over, they're serious, and that's a joke, but it's kind of true because it's, it's like people grow up in the Midwest in these little uh, closed communities where they you know, went to high school with people, and, and they're not used to... It's not like the coast where you've got people coming from all over the place and you always have to remake your circle of associates and friends and, and colleagues. Um, and and uh, I, I, in South Florida, anyway, in the Miami area, we were always quick to challenge each other. We argued what would sound like an argument to somebody in Minnesota or from the north would just be just talking. You know, part of that's <laughs> uh, cultural, like you, you have a lot of like Cubans and stuff who like to argue. And in my family, we like to argue. I have a, you know, <laughs> In part because there were so many of us, and we had to get our, each had to try to get a word in. But, uh, and I, I'm more comfortable with that way than with the sort of uh, sometimes passive aggressive way of the Midwest. Uh, uh, also, in in, uh, in uh, radio newsrooms, they like quiet because they they want to. Um, well, sometimes they're interviewing somebody on the phone. Newspaper newsrooms were always a lot louder. Maybe not so much anymore, but at, at one point, ten years ago, they were like a news uh, in a city, a newspaper newsroom, like, like the Post Dispatch probably had a few hundred reporters at one point. They don't anymore, and, and neither does the paper I work for in Florida. Um, uh, but they're still fairly loud and, and quote, aggressive places. Uh, and um, because, you know, we don't get a chance to get heard in print. And in radio, you get a chance to hear your voice and people get a chance to hear you on the radio. So maybe you're not so worried about being heard. It, it, uh, <laughs> I think radio is more polite, though. They, they, like, pass the mic, and everybody gets a chance to talk and, instead of interrupting each other. I'm more of the interrupting kind. If I can ask a follow-up to that. So you're, you're new to St. Louis by about a year? Year and a half now. Year and a half. Um, I've, I've been hearing, as someone who's been here since August, St. Louis is a particularly difficult place to get to know. Um, I've heard, you know, the where did you go to high school question. Oh, yeah. I haven't actually found this to be the case since I've been here, but it seems to be this thing people like to talk about a lot. But what advice do you have for sort of how you get into a community and start learning about it. I, I saw, you know, you wrote a, there was an interview with you about riding your bicycle through St. Louis, but what other things do you do to sort of... I, it took me a while place? in Minnesota, and it's, I'm still trying, it, it's, it can take five years to really feel comfortable and to have people, even in your own office, open up to you. Um, uh, but I, I think, one, you need to, we, in newsrooms, <clears throat> and this happens in a lot of other institutions too, like people in the university all probably live in one area. And, you, and you, if you start to think about all my friends and associates are kind of like me, uh, then that's not a good thing. you got to try to make yourself uncomfortable. One of the reasons a lot of us are in the business is because uh, some of us are kind of quiet and introspective. I don't have this like, split personality. Sometimes I'm very quiet. And sometimes I'm very not quiet. But, um, and, and it, in, it, it, it uh, compels us to engage people. And you have to do the same thing in your life, especially when you move to a new place. And in our business, Increasingly, people are going from place to place to place to place and not putting down the roots that they once did, and that makes you engage the community uh, faster uh, if you want to survive. Then, and and it, it, if you don't engage the community and you're working in journalism, you're not going to have the kind of sources because then you're going to have editors like me asking you, hey, I need some something from you, mm -hmm. and you're so busy in your own head that you're not engaging the pe community and meeting people and developing relationships with people. It's all about developing relationships. 
um, like I get pitches, my email box is jammed full of people who, th who think that the way to get my attention is to act as if they've known me for 20 years and I'll get these emails, hi David, like I don't know you, why are you treating me like that, you know? And if you really wanted me to pay attention to your issue, you would get to know me and establish a relationship with me and I would see a, hey, this is from Christy, I've gotta pay attention because it's from her. But, I'm, but somebody who's like a PR exec who's sending stuff out all the time, I'm like, I don't even see that thing, you know? Because I don't know the person. It's like, well, I'm, I'm the kind of person that if you send me a Facebook request and I don't know you, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna accept it. Now, you can follow me on Twitter all you want, you know? <laughs> even LinkedIn, I'm sort of like, eh, do I know this person? Or are they trying to sell me something? Or they, what do they want from me? I'm kind of guarded in that way. Uh, uh, now, sometimes I shouldn't be, you know? Uh, and I have to realize that about myself. Um, but, to, but in a community like this, uh, if, if you want to know people, you've got to do it, you know? Um, and that's the same thing in journalism. If you want to know something, if you want to be better, don't sit, you know, get out of the office, you know? Meet somebody, ask them a question. You know, next thing you know, something happens. And then they start to trust you more. Because if you don't have trust, like we can do, I can do, have my reporters do all the stuff they I want about say, the black community in St. Louis, and um, some people will see that. But the vast part of our audience, and this is uh, across the board, NPR across the board, is, uh, is uh, uh, baby boomers, mostly white, like 80% white, uh, mostly uh, upper middle class and middle class, and yet we're tr trying to act as if we serve the whole country. And people say, oh, NPR is great. Well, yeah, it's great, but it could be better if it had a more diverse newsroom and newsrooms across the country weren't so white. Uh, um, uh, and it, if uh, it appealed to people of different economic and, and social and economic levels and, and classes and all, all these things, uh, so because sometimes in public radio we have a tendency to pat our backs on the back, so pat our backs ourselves on the back so much. Oh, we're much better than the newspapers. Oh, oh no, not necessarily. Um, uh, you know, sometimes and sometimes I have to look in the mirror and say, "Am I part of the problem?" Uh, and we all have to do that in our work, especially in our in this business, which can be very humbling when you make a mistake, and you got to own up to it and say, "We made a mistake. We were wrong." Uh, but I think um, if we're going to be the place that everybody can turn to, and look to, and say, "Yeah, I can trust them," we got to make sure we're present in their lives and in their communities, uh, and then more people from those communities will turn to us, okay? because sometimes we do great stuff on people, but nobody knows about it, and then. There's the complaint, ah, oh, the media doesn't care about us. Well, so we, well, we really do, but we have to demonstrate it enough so that there's a growing awareness that we do pay attention, you know? Um, I was wondering, do you, is there an era in history or a point in time that you sort of point to as to when um, objectivity in journalism was perhaps like the most valued or more valued, or if it's like becoming less valued now, <coughs> is there a time that you can point to when it was? I, I think it is valued now, I, and I'm not I'm not a person who worries about the, the declining level of objectivity. I, I, d I do think that there are different ways people get their news, and some of those places aren't objective. I will tell you that there was a time when publishers got in duels on the street and shot each other, you know. Uh, uh, th and this was a, a real thing in the 1800s, you know. Uh, one of the, in Louisville, the, the, the lore of that paper was that, the, you know, one of their owners was in a gun battle. Uh, uh, at, now, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, when newspapers were really big, and even as before radio started to become really big, uh, and there were lots of reporters all over the place, uh, it, it was a very much a working class business. You know, you didn't have to have a college degree to do it. Uh, in the latter part of the 20th century, what we saw was uh, it, it was viewed as the professionalization of journalism, and it became like a, a hot thing to go into, especially post Watergate. And you know, part of this was bad because editors would 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 be looking for the latest guy who uh, graduated from Yale or Harvard. It, and so you would go into a newsroom, and the privileged guys who got to do, and they were all guys, by the way, they're all men, got to do everything uh, for the most part, uh, were sort of like these upper class uh, white guys who got to do everything. And then, and then there were other people, people like me, people, uh, uh, well, after the 70s and 80s, increasingly people like me. Mm -hmm. And then um, women and um, uh, immigrants who, who 
were like sort of there, but not really there. Uh, uh, and now uh, it's professional, and uh, and still we're concerned about objectivity, but we're also concerned about making sure that uh, we make room for different points of view, because some of that supposed objectivity was just the way the established class wanted it to be seen. Uh, and some of that supposed objectivity was like, police said this, so we're gonna go with the police said, and we're gonna, he said, she said, that's supposed objectivity. Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, so in some ways, it's better than it ever was. It's just that we have so many uh, different channels, and we're in this in, in, the, in the era of hyper-partisanship hyper that it seems worse. But uh, I, when I look at the stuff that's coming out of the nation's best newsrooms and some of the good work that's coming out of the local newsrooms across the country, I'm very heartened. It's just that I often don't see enough of it, and I'm worried that financial pressures are causing us to kick so many people out the door. Mm -hmm. And we're and then we hire, and I'm all for opening the doors to young people, but sometimes we kick so many people out the door that we have lost the intergenerational connections and the expertise and knowledge um, that is necessary for newsrooms to help those people who are rising by connecting them to people who know all the secrets. Because, you know, I want to know the secrets. I used to, uh, a friend of mine, and I used to do this too, I would write a story when I was in my late 20s, and it wasn't right, you know, and, and, and I would see that the editors would change it. So I started retyping it in the way they had done it to learn this is the vision that they have for how to present the news. These are the questions that they've asked me to, to ask the next time that I didn't get right this time. And so it's not just objectivity, it's sort of a professionalism, uh, how to present a story that is, you know, fair. Uh, and there's no one kind of story, by the way, because there's the straight news story, which is like, this happened yesterday. There's the anecdotal story where like, um, Susan Smith, you know, she goes to work every day, but uh, by the time she gets there, she's burdened because she's got so much, she's dealing with her mom who's got cancer and her daughter who's, you know, got, uh, 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 asthma, and she's just, and that's a, that sort of health story that's about her life is anecdotal. And then there's the profile, and then there's the Q, there's all of these different types, types of stories. So when we say objectivity, we're like, and that's called storyboarding, by the way. You can take any issue and say, is it a profile? Is it a Q&A? Is it an investigative piece? Is it a feature? Is it a this? Is it a that? And you can attack it any number of ways. Uh, and so when people talk about objectivity, I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, that's a thing, it's important, but we also making sure that we approach stories in different ways that appeal to different audiences and touch different things, including some of those things that we never used to touch. Like in the 60s when there was maybe supposed objectivity of that newspaper that I was carrying every day on my back, but uh, they weren't objective enough to cover the 20% of the people in the population who are black in my city, uh, except unless they went to jail. You know, Was that objective? No, because you know they, I, I grew up in a neighborhood with black doctors and dentists, and uh, as before uh, integration, where the community was it was segregated, but it was you know there were all, all kind of people doing things there, you know, and uh, um, but none of that was in the paper. So was that objective? No. They're, so their objectivity was like focused on one part of society. So uh, my idea of objectivity is an objectivity that focuses on different parts of society, including many that were left out. Now, some people say, hey, they're starting to include all these stories about people who are different, like they're having stories about transgender people, and I don't like that. They're not objective. Well, no, those are people who were ignored all along. To me, it's objective to, to include them, you know. Now, the way we write about them may not make some people happy, but, you know, sometimes they got to hang up their hands, you know. I don't, so I don't think objectivity is a problem, except in specific circumstances where somebody is hyper-partisan. I think, I mean, from a scholarly perspective, objectivity in the news really came in during the 20th century. So if you look back in the 19th century, it's really interesting when you look at, I, I looked at reconstruction journalism as part of a book that I wrote, and people would embed their ideas about policy into those stories. So there, were, there was never a, a sort of straight, here's just the facts. It was, here's what's wrong. I mean, I think one of my, it, it was fascinating to sort of see how much opinion they were investing. And I think it was in part sort of the, the type of objectivity we're talking about today, where just because 50-50 doesn't make it fair coverage. Um, they were really sort of trying to call out some of, of the evils, the people that I was studying at least, of, of the post-slavery period. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, a misconception to think of it as once it was objective and now it is not. Um, Michael Schutzen, who I think is at Columbia Journalism, um, wrote several books, but one of those is on the history of, of journalism and is an interesting person to check out. 
And sometimes I think the, the people who are doing that kind of thing now, like the Ta-Nehisi uh -huh. of the world, is he a journalist in the conventional sense? Maybe not, but he's doing great journalism, and he's filling in a lot of the blanks that a lot of us can't get to because we don't have the time to do that historical research. Mm -hmm. We don't have the notoriety and the space uh, that he has available to him. Uh, and I read his work. Now, sometimes when a young person comes in and they sort of want to do a ta kind of thing without the knowledge and the skill that he has, uh, and I want to say, hey, you know, you need to focus on doing what you can do well. Maybe someday you'll do that. But um, um, so but, uh, to me, objectivity for local journalism purposes is getting your facts right, making you include different points of view. Um, and, 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 you, and you know if you're being fair or not, you know. So I'm interested in how you've been affected since you've worked in local journalism for so long with budgetary restrictions and the opportunity to utilize wire stories or to use national programming. Do you feel like you've been limited in what you're able to report on um, or the opportunities and kind of how has that changed over time? Uh, yes, maybe a no. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did start out, in I've been in local journalism a long time. Uh, from a very small paper that had uh, wire services and it was editor driven and we were focused on really, really local stuff. And then to a big metropolitan paper that had wire services and editors who would combine stuff from those things. And some people doing, having the freedom to do re really big idea stuff and then the rest of us just covering City Hall and although it's important for a reporter to learn how to cover City Hall and car wrecks and, and school board meetings and I, I think it's very important actually. Uh, because you can't cover those big things unless you know how life works. Um, uh, and then to uh, a, a huge newspaper in South Florida that also had a lot of those advantages, uh, and now to public radio. So uh, to answer your question, I think, yeah, sometimes I'm, I'm worried about, uh, especially in, having been in two businesses where they decided to lay people off and reallocate resources. And uh, my last place, for example, we had a great web staff and they cut it in half and got rid of all the photographers. And I think photojournalism to me is really important um, and because you know pictures say a lot that you can't say in words. Just like audio says a lot, it captures a lot that you can't say in a, in a typed sentence. Um, uh, and everybody is trying to deal with declining resources or limited resources and how to make your staff do twice as much as they really should be doing because you're worried about, about uh, keeping the audience engaged, because some people don't click on websites and stuff if they don't see enough. You know, they want to see a lot. Sometimes, some people, if they see too much, they get turned off. Like, I'm always surprised at my Twitter feed because different people follow me for different reasons. Like, if I post something in Spanish, it makes somebody angry who follows me because I'm in the media. Or if I post something about music, it makes somebody angry who follows me for health and science, which I edit, or, or um, oh, weird stuff. Uh, uh, but. The business is changing so fast, and uh, the people who run these businesses are trying to do things that sometimes have not a whole lot to do with journalism because they're thinking about resources. Uh, yeah, it does concern me. Um, I don't think you can make a blanket statement about it, though. You know, and sometimes you have to just do things differently. It used to be, uh, like I worked for a paper in Fort Lauderdale that competed against the Miami Herald, and I I love competition because. You didn't want to get beat by that person, and it forced you to work harder. But now, newspapers in the same market are sharing each other's stories, and I feel kind of bad about that because, uh, in the golden age where I was, you know, I knew that the guy in the next newsroom was fighting just as hard to get the thing, of, you know, or the woman in the newsroom was fighting just as hard to get the story that I was getting, and sometimes she wiped me to pieces, and it made me feel bad, uh, or uh, or I might have to approach the story from a different way, and do a better story, but. She had it first, you know, and, and so I would feel good about having done the different take to consider different perspectives, uh, but bad that I wasn't as immediate. Um, uh, and that all has to do with the fact that we're trying to do too much with too few people and too little resources. And it, it, it's never going to be easy unless you're just one of those lucky people who, and there are some lucky people who get to work for the place where they get to do exactly what they want to do and they have all the money and the resources in the world to do it. 
I'm, I've never been one of those people. There are people like that. It's just not me. <laughs> so I hope this has been helpful. Um, oh. It's been fun. Well, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for, for coming out of your lunch hour um, to be a part of today. Um, I love playing hooky from work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, and have a lovely rest of your day. Okay.